Attention HR professionals. Are you tired of dealing with poor performance from your managers? Are you sick of having managers run to you for every single little problem? Would you like to build the confidence and competence of your management team? If so, then contact Boss Builders. At Boss Builders, we specialize in building up the skills and confidence of your organization's managers. We do this through our popular Driving Results on-site training programs, our signature program, the Video-Driven Boss Builder Academy, and we even license our course materials so you and your internal training staff can get those managers confident and competent. For more information on how we can help you improve the performance of your organization's managers, contact us today at www.thebossbuilders.com or at 931-221-2988. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of the Boss Builder Podcast, the podcast for the newly promoted supervisor, the supervisor who's been in the role for a short time and struggling, and even those of you who are thinking about making the transition to management. One of the things you are probably going to wrestle with, if you haven't already, is dealing with conflict in the workplace. It's something that is very common, but dealing with it effectively is something most of us don't do all that well. Our guest today is Kate Vendemio. Kate is an expert in dealing with conflict, and what she's going to do is give us some strategies on how to identify conflict, identify the sources of conflict, deal with conflict between two direct reports, and she'll even talk about what it's like when you as the boss have a conflict with one of your own direct reports. Very actionable, practical tips, and in the end, she's going to give you her contact information because believe me, you need to work with her to help you be more effective at dealing with conflict. So with no further delay, let's meet our special guest, Kate Vendemio. Kate Vendemio, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mac. I'm excited to be here. I'm really excited too. The topic today is one that a lot of folks struggle with, and the topic, of course, is conflict. But before we get into the questions, what I was hoping you could do is share a little bit about your background with us. Sure, absolutely. And thank you, Mac, for the opportunity. I'm really excited to be participating in this podcast. So I have worked in the world of learning and development for almost 15 years. My entire career has been with or for the federal government. I started off working in leadership development. Then I moved into strategic planning. And then the last six years, I was a management consultant where I worked on large scale government projects, redesigning and revamping uh, training curriculum for federal agencies. Uh, along the way, um, decided that I really wanted to shift my career. And so in 2018, September of 2018, I left my management consulting job and launched my own company. So I launched Mount Vernon Consulting in September. And um, along the way, I also started working as the training manager for the Maryland Women's Business Center. So I have two hats right now. Uh, the Maryland Women Business Center provides training and support to females who are starting or growing their businesses. And then Mount Vernon Consulting, my other hat, we provide training, delivery, and instructional design support to organizations who don't have the in-house resources and are looking for additional support. So That's great. Um, academically... Yeah. Um, my background is I have a Bachelor's of Arts in Communication from John Carroll University, which is near Cleveland, Ohio. I also have a Project Management Professional Certification. So I'm a PMP. I got that in 2011. And then I also have a Master's Certificate in Project Management from George Washington University in Washington, D.C., so I've got a whole bunch. I think what I bring to the table is I've been there. I've done it. I've done the project management. I've worked in large scale 
projects I've been in there um, facilitating and leading and designing. And so um, I really bring that to my experience. I bring the real life experience when I do my consulting work. That's great. Well, I guess one of the things that happens in real life is conflict. And so I want to ask you, and, and you've obviously seen it on a lot of different levels, why is conflict such a common thing in the workplace? Yeah. So I was thinking about it, Mac, and I thought that, you know, really, as you introduce this particular topic on your podcast, you should probably have the Jaws music playing in the background, <laughs> right? Because it just... It, it evokes these feelings of anxiety and fear. And that's exactly what people often think about conflict. So in order to think about conflict, we really need to think about what it is. And conflict is simply when there's an opposition of interests or ideas. It's completely natural. We all experience it in our personal life, professionally, you might be in conflict with someone on some type of social media board. Um, we all experience conflict, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. And what's important for bosses to remember is that really conflict can lead to effectively re resolving quite a few issues, and it can actually increase personal and professional growth. So you can't look at conflict as necessarily being something that's bad. Um, instead, I want to reframe your thought as we go through this podcast that conflict is inevitable. It's going to happen. And the best way to deal with it is if you're prepared for it. Well, when conflict happens, and I'm thinking about myself personally, uh, my conflicts generally happen when I'm flying. There's, I, I'm supposed to leave at a certain time and there's a delay and I get irritated and upset. But, And I feel uncomfortable. But is there some reason why people feel uncomfortable when there's conflict? Is there a reason why we always hear the Jaws music when we're about to get into it with somebody? <laughs> so there is a reason. There's a very physical reason. Um, and what's fascinating is how your body actually reacts to conflict. So let's say, for example, um, you invite a direct report into your office and you're going to deliver them some constructive feedback. And then all of a sudden he just flips out at you. He says, you're the worst boss you've ever had. You're the reason he can't be productive in the workplace and he hates working for you. So Mac, if you were in that situation, how would your body react? <laughs> <laughs> Every fiber in me would be trying to hold onto the side of the seat so I don't jump up and grab him by the throat. Right? I right? would just because be he's tense. Been, yeah. Of course. So you, you're you suddenly feeling like you're in danger. Your reputation is in danger. Um, your ability to manage is in danger. And what happens is physically, your hands likely get sweaty. Your heart starts to race, your muscles tense up, might even start to form into a fist. And then oftentimes your brain gets foggy. And here's where I think it gets really interesting. Your brain gets foggy because you're actually going into fight or flight mode. So you're understanding that all of a sudden your brain is taking over and it's actually called your amygdala hijack. So there, the amygdala is a component of your brain that triggers your emotional response. And when you're in this fight or flight mode, your amygdala takes over the rest of your brain. So your ability to think rationally and to communicate with people it, it diminishes because your amygdala takes it over. It's received a distress signal. What I think is so fascinating about the amygdala hijack is that research indicates that when your brain uh, is hijacked by the amygdala and in conflict, it takes an average of 18 to 20 minutes for it to calm back down. So if you think about a toddler who is throwing a temper tantrum, um, it frequently can take them a while to calm themselves down. And even as adults, we have our own sort of temper tantrum, but we have a more evolved way of managing it. <laughs> so we're still panicking inside. Um, but it takes an average of 18 to 20 minutes for someone to recover from an amygdala hijack. But not only that, while this is going on, adrenaline and cortisol chemicals are released into your bloodstream, and it takes three to four 
hours for those chemicals to clear from your bloodstream. So if you have conflict in the workplace, it can take you up to a half a day for your body to recover. Well, that's frightening because I'm also thinking that what begins and ends most people's work days, and I'm thinking specifically about where you live, is a commute down 270 yeah. or around 495, which on its own is enough to make a person want to have, you said, the amygdala hijack right there on the road. <laughs> that's really scary. So interestingly, part of what led to me really having a, a career and lifestyle shift is that um, I was commuting 48 miles round trip daily um, from in suburban D.C., so from Maryland down to Virginia, like you said, down to 70, around 495. And after six years of intense stress, I actually... I was having a lot of problems with my back and my shoulders and I went to a chiropractor and he said, you are gripping the steering wheel so tight that your body can't relax. And that was sort of the icing on the cake to make me realize that for a variety of reasons, it was time to change. <laughs> well, I guess what you could have done is maybe taken your hands off the wheel and given people the finger. That's kind of like a physical therapy, wouldn't it be? You know, I have, that's, that's its own form of therapy. Um, <laughs> I have two small children and it's nothing like two children to bring to your attention how um, childlike you can behave when driving. <laughs> so I've had to really monitor that and curb that. <laughs> Not to mention, you know, they could watch us put away our socks and they won't do that, but you say a bad word and then that's the thing they remember. It's exactly. pretty amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I'm really stressed just thinking about it. As, as we speak, I'm getting ready to fly to Maryland for some business tomorrow, and I will be commuting down 270 going to PG County. So um, I, I need to hear more about this because I have a feeling after being gone from there five years, this will come back very quickly. <laughs> uh, I'm feeling stressed right now. All right. Well, then let's let's take it back to the workplace, because this is there are some people listening who say, you guys are insane. I don't have to worry. I, I, I live five minutes from work and I live in Middle Tennessee, like where I live now. So what are some triggers for conflict that happen in the workplace? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's, you know, there's all kinds of different reasons why people go into the workplace or go into conflict in the workplace. But generally, you can lump it into a couple categories. So my research has indicated that across the board, one of the most common sources of conflict in the workplace is poor communication. So let's say the scope of a project changes, but the project manager neglects to inform the staff, then that often results in conflict. So when you have different communication styles, you maybe have someone on the team who's more directive, another person who maybe communication is not their strength, that can cause problems, or just a blatant failure to communicate. And one of the challenges for our newer bosses is that frequently you're in the middle management role. So if someone from up top neglects to tell you something or someone that reports to you neglects to tell you something, that can create a lot of issues for your role. So we've got poor communication. Another source of conflict in the workplace is personality clashes. People just, we have different values. There's different things that motivate us. And we can all think in our head of an example of times that we've seen different personalities clash in the workplace. Another contributor to it is personal problems. So true story, one day I was, um, our team was having a, a wedding shower for one of our colleagues. Um, you know, everyone was just going into the conference room and having a wedding cake and celebrating. And I popped my head into my coworker's office and I said, hey, are you coming are you going to pop over for a minute? And she just went off on me about how these are just ridiculous. And how do we even have the money to pay for this cake? And this is why everyone's working late is because we take time out to celebrate. And I'm thinking, um, <clears throat> what's going on here? <laughs> so, um, and it turns out later on when I was able to talk to her in a calmer moment, it turns out that her and her husband were about to go through a divorce. Um, and so this clearly triggered something. Um, the thing that's 
really tricky about when people have personal problems is that oftentimes conflict can arise without warning or something with seemingly an, an innocent statement or comment can really have a cause and effect. And so it's inevitable people's personal lives will bleed into the workplace, no matter how much you preach that it, it shouldn't. It does, and it manifests itself in different ways. So if you're caught off guard by someone's uncharacteristic response to something, you might want to think about, is there something going on at home that we don't know about? <laughs> well, I guess that makes it really hard. I'm thinking specifically for a supervisor who comes to work and they just realize, why can't people just work? Why can't they just yeah. leave all the baggage behind? But yeah, I think we spend our, our best hours. And so it's likely to happen. Well, you've given us the triggers, something as simple as I'm going through a divorce and you're celebrating a wedding shower. I see that. Mm -hmm. So aside from this one colleague of yours that did that, what are some other ways that people handle conflict in a workplace? So the thing that I think is most critical and one point that I really want to get across in this podcast is that conflict is inevitable. It's going to happen. It happens in your personal life. It happens professionally. And in order to combat and deal with it, you need to arm yourself with the proper knowledge to be able to respond. So the go-to tool for understanding your conflict mode is called the Thomas Kilman Conflict Mode Instrument, which is otherwise known as TKI. I'm not going to go into a lot of the nuances of TKI, mainly because most people are probably listening to this and driving, <laughs> and I, I want to keep you engaged. Um, but TKI is it's it's fascinating. It really talks about the five primary conflict handling modes that people have. So, if you are ever given a chance to take any type of training. Uh, through TKI, and it helps provide insight to you, um, I highly recommend you do it. And when I go into it in a little bit, if it pikes your interest, I'd recommend that you do some Google search and do a little bit more research. Because if you just type in TKI conflict mode or Thomas Kilman conflict mode into Google, you'll find page after page of results. Uh, but essentially, the framework for TKI is that there, there's two real basic dimensions for how a person behaves when in conflict. There's assertiveness, which is the one axis, and that's the degree to which you try and satisfy your own concerns when you're in conflict. And then the other axis is the cooperativeness, so the degree in which you try and satisfy the other person's concerns. So let's think about it like this. I'm gonna I'm gonna go through. Real quick, those five conflict handling modes. And as I'm listing it, I want you and our listeners to think about which area describes them the most. Um, so the first one okay. is collaborating. So the first conflict handling mode is collaborating. It's when two heads are better than one. So let's work together to come through this project. And perhaps our answer is going to be better than if we each came up came to it with our own. The second one is accommodating. And that's when you say, you know what, it would it would be my pleasure. And so you kill them with kindness and you decide you're going to accommodate yourself in order to meet their needs. The third one is compromising. So that's when we say, OK, let's make a deal. We're not each going to get 100 percent of what we want, but we're going to meet in the middle. The fourth one is avoiding when you have the approach of I'm just going to think about it tomorrow. Um, and that's a very common one people have. And then the last one is competing. And so it's it's my way or the highway. It's going to be my way. You're wrong. I'm going to put my foot in the ground and make sure that everyone does it my way because that's how I want to handle it. So I went through that really quickly. So again, collaborating, accommodating, compromising, avoiding, and competing. And I had said at the beginning, you know, think about which applies to you, but also think about which of your staff members this applies to. Because as I'm going through it, I'm sure you can probably think of people you work with who avoid conflict or just want to make peace with it. And so they'll accommodate it. 
So the thing about TKI is that no particular mode is correct, and all of them are useful depending on the situation. So as a boss, what's really important is for you to, one, be self-aware, beware of how you respond to conflict, and two, be aware that everyone else has their own way of dealing with it. And so if you're conflict averse, but you have a staff member that reports to you who looks at comp who looks at conflict as a competition, you're going to need to adjust your style in order to work with them when it comes to conflict. Well, these styles, Kate, are these something, I mean, is it like for me, what I, if I had one that was comfortable, would I use that all the time? Or do you find that some people shift up? So we have ways of defaulting. So it's not, you you generally default to a particular mode of conflict. And what TKI does, if you actually go through the test itself, I think it's $45. You might be able to find some knockoffs for free online. But um, the exam itself will actually, it takes I think it's got about 40 questions and it will produce a very in-depth report as to what your default conflict mode is, and then also insights as to um, when the other conflict modes are appropriate or how you can adapt your conflict mode accordingly. So I think we all have default ways of handling it, but what's critical is acknowledging that you have to expand your response when you're a supervisor because people are all going to have their own ways of reacting to things. And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Attention HR professionals and conference planners. Are you looking for a great speaker for your upcoming meetings or conference? Better contact Mac. Do you need someone who can relate to your audience and deliver a top-notch presentation? Better contact Mac. Are you trying to find a speaker who can both educate and entertain? Better contact Mac. Mac Monroe, the boss builder, is a sought-after keynote speaker and presenter who would love to present at your next meeting. His most popular topics are how to be a great boss for audiences of managers and executives, how to gain a seat at the table for HR professionals, and how to avoid ending up for all employees. Mac is a phenomenal storyteller, and his talks are lively, entertaining, and loaded with actionable strategies that will enable your attendees to make immediate positive changes. To get more information and book Mac to speak at your next conference or meeting, go online to bettercontactmac.com or call us at 931-221-2988. And now, back to the show. Well, I want to go back to something you said earlier. You were talking about amygdala hijack. Is it so? I mean, it seems logical that if my amygdala was hijacked, my default place to go would be the what's the one where you put your foot in the ground? Um, competing, right? Yes. Yes. Because I mean, I'm thinking I'm going back to the beltway, right? Exactly. I want to get in the next lane and you and my signal's on and you're not making eye t contact with mm -hmm. me. And now I'm really frustrated. So what am I going to do? I'm going to start inching my way over. That's, I guess, my form of competing. But if my amygdala was triggered, I, I don't know if it would be likely that I would say, now that I'm so spun up, why don't we talk about our feelings <laughs> and, and tell me what's so important about it. Does it, am I just, is it? does it work that way or do we go when our amygdala is hijacked to the, the dark side? So we do go to the dark side, but what's critical is that we need to be aware of it. Um, and one way to deal with it, I mean, you have to recognize that there's emotions that come into it and your emotions take over um, when your amygdala is hijacked. You become angry, you become upset. Um, and so the one of the best ways to deal with it is to take a deep breath or pause. So I know it sounds pretty simple, but oftentimes when you're in the height of conflict, you know, stopping and just taking a deep breath in and out can start to calm down your body and it starts to release endorphins and other chemicals in your body to counterbalance that adrenaline that's running through it. So, you know, perhaps being on the beltway, I, I will be careful to not drive on the beltway tomorrow if you are going to be in town, Mac. Um, but, um, you know, really, I think that the best way to deal with it is to just 
just pause for a moment. And sometimes if you're in the workplace and you're facing conflict, what you frequently might need to do is actually step away from the situation until you can gather your thoughts. That makes sense. Well, I do get a lot of questions from people that are in our programs or who watch our stuff online. And one of this is a pretty common one. And so I want to see if maybe you can give us some insights on it. I am the boss and I got these two employees that just can't seem to get along. Mm -hmm. What should I do? Right. Isn't that frustrating? (laughs) Mm. Well, it is for them. And I I guess I can I can empathize. And I've seen this before, but they're frustrated. They don't know whether they should dive in or you know, the easy answer is let's separate them, but that's not always possible. So what do you recommend? Yeah. So discord in the workplace is common. We all know it. We've all experienced it and it affects everybody. It makes the office uncomfortable. Um, it impacts your business productivity. And and I think that's where you have to sometimes make the distinguishing the differentiation between emotions and then the impact that it has. So the first thing to do when you've got conflict in the workplace is as the boss. So let's say this situation is if your staff is having conflict um, and you as the boss need to, you're, you're experiencing this, you're witnessing this. So the first thing is you need to understand the nature of the conflict and you need to make sure that it is not some type of EEO, so equal employment opportunity. You want to make sure it's not some type of EEO situation. So if there is a situation of workplace violence or harassment or discrimination, that's when you immediately go to your HR department and you get them involved because that's that's an issue. Let's say for the sake of this that this is not an EEO issue and instead you just have two people that don't get along. So I actually, I had this situation at one point in my career. Um, I had two direct reports who absolutely just were not getting along. The trust was broken somewhere along the way between the two of them, and it just went downhill and it was snowballing. And you'd sit in meetings and you could feel the tension. And then they both started coming to me and nitpicking on the other person, and essentially tattling. So if you're in that situation, right, we've all been there and you know, they come in and you know where this is going. And so the best way to deal with that when you're in that type of situation is that you encourage your employees to work it out themselves. You are not their mother. You're their supervisor. These are adults. And so if they have a conflict with each other, the best way to handle it at first, so your first approach would be to encourage them to talk to each other. What you can do as a supervisor is you can give them a framework so you can talk to them about active listening, about using I statements, but you want to encourage them and empower them to work it out themselves because you don't want to turn into having a team where everyone comes tattling to mommy or daddy when things don't go well. So in this situation, I I encouraged my two staff members to go and talk to each other. I'm truthfully not sure how well that went because it continued to snowball. Um, and, and I had really, it was, it was personality clash. I had one person who had a much more dominant personality. Um, and, and then I had another one who was more meek. And what was happening is, is the dominant one was was making the meek one so nervous and upset that she actually became paralyzed in her productivity. And that's when I need to step in because this conflict is now impacting our ability to produce. It's impacting my team's ability to hit deadlines. And so this is becoming an issue um, and it's a reflection on my management. So that's when you need to step in. So again, if you're in this type of situation and you end up having to mediate the first thing you want to do is I'd recommend doing a change of scenery. So for these two particular ladies, we were on a client site and I said to them, you know, let's go to the cafeteria and grab some lunch and sit down and we're going to work this through. And so we were in a neutral spot. If you don't have something like a cafeteria, maybe you guys take a walk. Maybe you go to a conference room on a different floor that you don't normally go to. 
But having a neutral territory can oftentimes neutralize the situation. You also want to focus on the facts. So let's not bring emotions into it. Let's not bring office rumor into it. You want to focus on the facts. So, you know, today when I, I listened to the two of you communicate, there was a tremendous amount of tension that the office could feel. And so I want us to talk through what's going on. Um, once you get them to talk through it, and you frequently want to encourage them to talk with each other. So you're really just the mediator, making sure that everyone is, you're, you're sort of like the referee, making sure that everyone's behaving in the appropriate boundaries. Um, then you want to get them to commit to a realistic change. And when you, when you leave the situation, we want all parties involved to know what action items they're going to take to improve the situation. And in the case of my two ladies, we had a rather long lunch. We got it worked out. They both walked away with ways that they could improve communication with each other. And we honestly did have a notable change for the positive. And our team got back on track. And I was really happy that we were able to address it. But sometimes, every once in a while, you actually have to acknowledge that sometimes this match isn't going to work. And maybe that means one of your team members needs to leave your team or they need to leave your department, or it might be an issue that this person is not the right fit for your company. And when you start going down the route of reorging, moving people, shifting them around, possibly getting them to leave the organization, that's when you want to loop in HR. And you want to use HR as your partner to help you and give you the tools that you need to go down that path. Wow, that's a, it's a lot of work, <laughs> but I think, I think the boss, that's part of their job. Now, earlier, you gave mm -hmm. me a little scenario to see how to react. And there's the employee that comes in and said, you're a stupid boss and I hate you. And OK, so let's take that one. I mean, there are some employees, I'm sure, who would do that. So if the conflict is between the boss and a direct report, how should that be handled? Right. Well, you obviously just kick them out and tell them to never come back, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's what yes. you want to. Right. And you've got a couple other choice <laughs> thoughts and words to say along the way. But I mentioned this earlier and the number one thing is when you're feeling like you're in conflict and you feel like your amygdala is, is being hijacked is you want to pause and take a deep breath. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I, I need, I'm going to go take a quick walk or, Hey, um, why don't you step out and we're going to take a 10 minute break and then we're going to come back and you walk and get a cup of coffee or you, um, you know, if you're a journal, if you need to write things out, you journal things, whatever you need to do. But when you're in conflict, the worst is going to be when you're angry and upset and you lash back at the person. And again, you're the boss, you're the supervisor, you're the person that's going to be taking the high road and setting the example for the rest of your team. So you pause and you take that deep breath and then you gather your thoughts and you bring the individual back in. And in this situation, if it's an employee who is yelling and screaming at you. So this is when you really use your active listening skills and your I statements. So identify the symptoms and the sources of the issue that surround the conflict. And you do it in the framework of open-ended questions. So, gee, employee, I sense that you might be a little bit frustrated right now. Can you talk to me about that? And then you let them talk it through with you. As you're letting them talk it through, you want to listen to your conflict partner without emotion. And this is where it's so hard because conflict is so tied in with emotion. But particularly as supervisors, we need to keep in mind, remember we talked about sources of conflict. Maybe it's something that is a personal issue going on. Maybe this is a person who just has always grown up in an environment where people just scream to blow things off and then they're fine a couple minutes later. So you want to just focus on the facts and tune out the emotions that are involved in this. Then from there, you want to mutually agree upon steps and timelines to accomplish these goals. So you want to work through how you're going to get to this situation. But 
in examples, you know, such as the example I gave earlier, where you're giving feedback to the employee, they needed to have constructive feedback, you still need to set the tone. And you know, I am the supervisor. So you can say things like, my expectations are X, Y, and Z. What area or what ideas do you have to help us get to that point? And so you're putting it back into the employee's um, power to think through the solutions, but you're making it clear that these are your expectations and your employee needs to come up with some of those ideas. If they're not in a mind frame where they can do that, then you say to them, take this away, think about this, and we're going to connect in a couple days or a couple hours and talk this through, but you can't let this one slide. And then lastly, you want to make sure that you're scheduling time to follow up on the progress and you're providing them with regular feedback. Hey, employee, um, the other day I noticed that you did X, Y, and Z, and that's something that we talked about. And I'm really excited and I'm, I'm really proud that I saw you implement that based on my feedback. How did that work for you? Anything I can do to support you? So that's what I would recommend when you have conflict between you and a direct report. but it is, um, gosh, it's hard. It's hard when you're in that situation. And it's hard for the rest of your staff because they almost always know what's going on. And they're watching you. They're watching you to see how you react. Just like a child is going to test the boundaries of the parent, the staff members are watching to see how you respond. And if you hit this one out of the ballpark and you address the situation up front and you do it successfully, then the rest of your staff is going to gain so much respect for you. You know, I know there's probably some people listening to this right now that after that answer want to throw up in their mouth just a little bit. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to tell you, you could certainly use your positional authority and kick the person out of your mm -hmm. office. But that's the easy mm -hmm. way out. And if you're going to be a great boss, you've got to adopt better strategies because the damage will be done. Certainly you squash the problem right there, but it's going to pop up like whack-a-mole. So for those of you right now that say, there's no way I'm going to do that, <laughs> grow up and do it. You've got some great tools and strategies right there. Anybody can just lay down the hammer, mm -hmm. but you're better than that. Mm -hmm. Well, Kate, I've enjoyed this talk. I want to ask you one more question. Okay. And so it sounds like you've given us some great strategies to deal with conflict. And I don't think I've ever encountered any place that doesn't have conflict. So if we can't avoid it, what are some ways that we can simply make the best of it? Right. And that's, that's such a good point you make is that anyone who's listening to this, try and think back of any job you've had where you haven't had conflict. I can't, I can't think of anything and conflict is, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. And so as a supervisor, what you want to do is you want to be self-aware. So going back to that TKI, the Thomas Kilman instrument, do some research on that. Be self-aware, know how you respond in conflict. If you're a yeller and you're a screamer and you're a person who just lashes out and gets really upset, that's not appropriate in the workplace. If you are a person who avoids conflict at all costs possible, that's also not productive in the workplace. So self-awareness can take you really far. The other thing, and if, if we can't avoid conflict, how do we make the best of it, is give yourself the tools of how to equip yourself to manage conflict. So listening to this podcast is obviously your first step in that. But also, you know, if there's ever some training that you can go to that specifically is about conflict management, um, if there are additional books you can read, blogs you can reference, um, but you, what you want to do is prepare yourself because you don't want to be caught off guard in a conflict situation and not know how you're going to respond. So go through scenarios in your head. Think about if something did happen, reflect on it and think, how could I have handled that more effectively? Did that work? Pay attention to how your colleagues handle stress and conflict. There might be someone who's a mentor in your workplace and you can observe them how they handle the situation or you can ask them. But in order to be successful, you have to acknowledge that it exists it's going to inevitably happen. And so you need to have all the tools in your toolbox to help you respond to it in a positive way. 
That's great. Well, Kate, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk about this really, really relevant and important topic. How can my listeners get a hold of you? Well, thank you so much, Mac. I really enjoyed this and you know, conflict is such a broad topic. I could I could go on for several podcasts about it. So, um, but I really thank you for the opportunity um, to be able to speak to it. And I hope my my passion comes across because I really believe if you do this effectively, you can really you're moving your way up in the world, in the supervisory world, and that's a great thing. So the best way to reach out to me is you can always go on my website. So again, I am Mount Vernon Consulting. My website is www.mtvernonconsulting.com. You can always send me an email at kate, K-A-T-E, at mountvernonconsulting.com, M-T-V-E-R-N-O-N consulting.com. You can friend me on LinkedIn under Kate Vendemio, always welcoming new people um, into my LinkedIn. And then lastly, I'm on Instagram at mount.vernonconsulting. That's great. Well, Kate, thank you again for spending time with us today. We appreciate it and look forward to maybe hearing from you in a future episode. Wonderful. And have safe travels tomorrow, Mac, to the great state of Maryland. It's beautiful weather here, and we love when we have guests come visit. Well, thanks for taking the time to listen to another episode of the Boss Builder Podcast. You know, if you're listening to these as you are commuting to and from work, I would highly recommend you listen again when you get home just so you can take some notes. We do our best to get you great information. And sometimes if you're like me, you got to write the stuff down. On another note, for your further development, if you work for an organization and you think that it would be valuable to partner with us, which I think is a good idea, We invite you to check us out online at thebossbuilders.com. We have three options, our signature driving results on-site workshop, which our trainers come out and deliver for you. We also have our very popular Boss Builder Academy, which is video driven. And we also offer the option of having your organization license our training materials so that your trainers can go ahead and deliver them on-site. If you're listening to our podcast on iTunes or on Stitcher, the other thing we'd appreciate is if you could just take a moment and leave us a brief, positive, of course, review. That would really help us out a great deal. And refer this podcast to anybody you know that you think could benefit from it. Until the next time we meet, get out there, boss up, boss on, and more importantly, make a commitment to being the boss at being a great boss. Goodbye.